In this video, I'm going to go over intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces. So the difference between intermolecular forces and intramolecular forces, intramolecular, is that intra refers to inside. So if we had H2O, then intramolecular forces it describes the forces that go on that are holding the H2 and the O together. Like that would be the you know covalent bonds, covalent or uh, ionic bonds. Whereas intermolecular forces uh, sort of describes if we have a H2O molecule, how it affects other H2O molecules. And so these kind of forces, that, that is intermolecular forces. And so a lot of these forces have to do with, well, the London dispersion forces, or London dispersion forces. Dispersion forces. And this really, this, these whole forces here sort of describe basically the shift in electron density. And so what that means is, if we have say hydrogen fluoride then if because fluorine is more electronegative more electronegative then it's going like more electronegative than hydrogen then we are going to see at any given point the electrons are going to hang around fluorine more i mean they, they'll still hang around hydrogen a bit but because fluorine wants to attract because electronegativity is more attraction of electrons then at any given point we're going to have a lot more electrons at fluorine so God dang it. so if we were to map this as a sort of a electron density we'll see it sort of like look like that I'll just draw that a bit better computer lag there or the sun was in my eyes or something so it's going to look something like this where where you can see the bulge here refers to more electrons or more electron density and this is actually pretty cool because it has a huge amount of um, consequences for just simply having it more on the fluorine side and not only just the, between the inside the individual molecule but it affects a lot of other molecules so if we have lots of hydrogen fluorides actually I'm not, I'm not going to do the circle around it anymore then let's just keep drawing, bear with me for a second here then because this basically essentially because the electrons are more concentrated around the the fluorine we're gonna have this be more negative and so consequently this is going to be relative uh, you know in comparison it's going to be more positive so this is sort of like a like imagine a bar magnet you know we have a bar magnet, and we have the north side, and we have the south side. Then, you know, this, let's arbitrarily call this the positive end. This is going to be, say, more positive. And this is going to be more negative because they're polar. And so that's what this refers to, is that it's going to have poles. We're going to have a negative side where the electrons are more likely to be, then we're going to have a positive side. So when we have multiple hydrogen fluorides, they're going to align themselves. Like if we had, you know, a hundred bar magnets, and I'll just draw two to rep or three to represent a hundred, then you know these are going to. Well, let's just forget about that bottom one. But if this is the north side and this is the south, then this one, the north and south, or the north repels another north, so the north is going to be farther away on this one. So the north is going to attract the south end. So, and then if we had another one here, that north pole is going to repel another North Pole. So the North Pole can't go here, it would have to go here. And so it would attract the South Pole. And so that's a lot like how these will align. We'll 
we'll have a hydrogen fluoride. And since this is negative, and this is in comparison positive, then this next one, the negative, is going to repel more negative. So it's going to have to attract the more positive side. And so these molecules here are kind of like the bar magnets. And so they'll align themselves. These will be aligned. And that's the same that will happen here. You know, we'll have a hydrogen on one side. So that we can actually, the, the molecular geometry is very important and it gets very interesting because, you know, this, like if we had a fluorine, let's say we had a, uh, a backwards hydrogen fluorine, then these are going to repel and they're going to align in, on average or an entire like substance, they're going to align like the bar magnets. So there's a, that, that is the dispersion forces. The dispersion forces refers to, you know, the electrons are kind of getting shifted over here onto this side. Now, there's a couple types of um, dipoles. Now, polar, like this is a polar molecule. Polar is also referred to as dipole. They mean essentially the same thing. And so there's a few types of polar molecules or, or intermolecular forces that have to do with these polar molecules. One is an instantaneous instantaneous dipole. So an instantaneous dipole is say we had a molecule which is not considered polar. Say we had O2 where O is um, O2 where O is bonded to another O Oops. Oh, that was a terrible O. So no a terrible O whatever. O2. So these ones are not electronegative because they're they attract electrons similarly. So if we took the, you know, the wave function is going to look fairly it's not going to have any bulges. So an instantaneous dipole can occur when because the electrons the locations of the electrons is sort of random, you know, it could be here, it could be here, it could be here. Just having, let's say the electron just so happens to be here at any given point, just this instantaneous second, it happens to be there. Well, because that electron is closer to this O, then this O is going to be more positive, whereas this O is going to be more negative because it has the electron closer to it. That is called an instantaneous dipole. There's also another type of uh, dipole, and that's a permanent dipole. And a good example of this, a permanent dipole is one that will always be polar. So again, hydrogen fluoride is a great example. Fluoride is more electronegative, and so we'll see the bulge over there. And so that, that is permanent because it won't change. The instantaneous dipole is not permanent because the electron could move over here in the next second, and all of a sudden this would be reversed. So these are the types of uh, dipoles that we can have and say say we have uh, let's go with well let's just say we had a bunch of hydrogen fluoride again or fluorine again hydrogen fluoride because hydrogen fluoride is cool and it's very easy to draw now if we have a container of hydrogen fluoride because these dipoles will align the molecules according to the you know the electron bulges and we'll just draw a couple more. Then these are sort of a line, kind of like I'll just draw them with parallel lines. Then, if we heated this substance up, let's say let's say we had this, and they're all they're all nice and aligned, nice and aligned. Then, if we added heat we are going to increase the rate at which they, they sort of bounce around, right? You know, they could bounce around like this. Then this can break up the intermolecular force. So if we added, you know, some nice, nice heat, I'll just draw this with yellow squiggly lines, then that can actually overpower. The thermal agitation can overpower the intermolecular forces. So these, these weakly, you know, aligned dipoles, if we add heat, we'll mix it all up. And so then we can end up with, with this again hydrogen fluoride, and we'll just do where they sort of like lose their alignment. And 
and so they could be in any sort of direction they want. And that's because of the added heat. So really, you know, the intramolecular forces only happen at say lower temperatures. And that's that's not true for everything. But if we have ice, and ice is a crystal shape, so if we have H2O and we have, you know, nice ordered crystal structures, I can't really draw crystal structures. I'm not even gonna try. Erase. But I'll try and represent it. So if we have, well, I don't know, let's say let's say we what the heck happened there? Let's say we have a nice block of ice. Um okay. What the heck? So let's say we have a nice block of ice. Then because the ice molecules are going to be nice and aligned, like the hydrogen fluorine, fluoride, I keep messing that up too, then if we add heat, then that will break up the bonds and so that they're unordered. And imagine these as water molecules. It's just going to be this puddle. Then the adding heat to break these intermolecular bonds is going to be called the heat of fusion. And this is sort of a, a physics concept for most, but it really relates to chemistry because if we add heat to ice, then we are adding thermal agitation to break the intermolecular forces. And so that, that sort of has to do with viscosity as well. If we have honey, honey is very sticky, and as you know, it's hard to pour because of its viscosity. But if we add heat, and we just add heat to this honey, then it becomes more, more, more liquidity, more, more liquid, if you will, smoother, because its viscosity is being changed. And that has to do with we're adding heat, we're kind of adding the thermal agitation, breaking up these intermolecular bonds. And so that's a that's a general overview of how these, you know, intermolecular forces kind of operate.